So automatic protection has been part of design for decades. And in the old days, it used to be mostly they were relay based. And why did we use relays? Well, the reason we use relays is because relays had a pretty well-defined and reliable failure mode. So that is, if you had an energized coil with a normally closed relay contact, 96.8 to 97% of the time, when you de-energize that coil, the relay contact will open. Now, of course, that presupposes that the relay contact is not what we call cold welded, doesn't have any furring, doesn't have any um, corrosion on it. And when I was designing back in the early 80s with ICS, we still used relays on the outputs. And what we used to do is we would we'd use a wetting current for a lot of the relays. <clears throat> and that was that meant that we used to pass six milliamps of current through the contact to keep it what we called wet. So in other words, the contact would be able to open if we de-energize the relay. But again, there was no standard as such to say when you would use this. So we used to use them where it was recognized that it needed to be used. And that really depended upon the company and the application. And ICI was one of those companies that pioneered this. Now interestingly enough, ICS uh, founded, was founded in 1967 by two guys again, and the reason they moved into the safety arena was because of the Flixborough disaster that happened in the early 70s uh, for ICI. And then that really put a light on uh, these systems and the fact that we needed to be more reliable, we needed to have safer operation. So ICS went into safety systems and most of the early ICS systems were relay based. So relays were pretty good. The only problem with relays is number one, bulky. You know we used to on the output relays we had these big Potter and Broomfield relays that would take up uh, massive amounts of room and the the motherboards to hold them had to be at least you know, half an inch thick. They were very, very big, and of course, they consumed a lot of power, a lot of energy. So that made it difficult for a lot of applications, specifically offshore applications, because in the um, in 70s and 80s, the offshore exploration in, on, in the UK side was very, very big, as well as on the Scandinavian side. So offshore, you had a very um, tight amount of space that you you had available to you. So we needed an alternative to relays. So along comes the so-called integrated circuit, the IC chip, which now gave us the ability to miniaturize and have the equivalent of the switching in a small silicon chip. So that gave us tremendous advantage in terms of footprint. We could now get a much larger volume in a smaller space. So we could achieve that for the offshore. It also helped us to reduce some of the, the power requirements. So instead of being 24 volts, which we'd used with the relays, we were using five volts with the solid state. However, here again, in the 70s, it was only installed where it was thought it was or recognized it was needed. There was nothing driving it to be put into place. The other problem we came across was we no longer had the reliability for uh, the same reliability that we had for the relays. Because with a silicon chip or with an integrated circuit, you could have fail open or fail short. And the trouble is, it wasn't that predictable. So 50-50, you could either go short circuit or you could go open circuit. So it made the, made the fail safe more complicated. 
So we, we had one advantage in, in terms of size and power, and we had a second disadvantage in that now we had an unpredictable failure. We didn't know if it was going to fail short or fail open. Enter the 1980s, and one of the first things I had to do at ICS was design a microcontroller for our I.O. And we started to use microprocessors. So the trend was for what was called a programmable logic controller, a PLC, to replace the solid state and relay based systems. So here again, it enabled us to do a lot more in a smaller package, but now we added yet another twist because now we were adding software. And here's a term I'm going to use. A couple of times you'll hear me use this. Software is inherently covert. So we have two types of failures. We can have an overt failure. Overt means it's revealed. So you'll get some form of either spurious trip or you'll get a discrepancy if it's a two out of three system, for example. And covert means hidden. And software is inherently covert because we all know that you could have a bug in software that could be there for a long time until the program executes a certain path it hasn't done before and we end up with either a dangerous situation because now we're not working or functioning the way we expect to function, or we may end up with some indeterminate state, which is just as bad. How, how many of you had the blue screen of death with Windows? I mean, crikey, <laughs> we've all been there. The other thing that happened in the 1980s was we started introducing some techniques for doing some risk analysis. So the HAZOP was introduced, HAZOP being hazard and operability study. So when we talk about doing hazard and risk assessments or process hazard assessments, the PHA or H&RA, then the HAZOP is probably one of the most commonly used techniques to do that. However, the studies also showed that there was not a decrease in accidents so again, why was this? What was causing this to, to occur? And in fact, I, I, um, when I was with ICS, I was on the, um, the SEMS PLC committee. SEMS PLC we basically was a committee that was looking at coming up with standard programming languages for PLCs. And ultimately, the initial work that was done through the SEMS PLC ended up going into the IEC 6011-31 of the five programming languages for PLCs that we have today. But back then, there was no standard for uh, programming PLCs. So, enter the 1990s. Now, what happened in the 1980s, towards the end of the 1980s, in 1988, was the Piper Alpha disaster in the North Sea, and it's still the worst maritime disaster uh, that's occurred. After the, the Piper Alpha, I mean, when I was at ICS at that time, we had a three-year order book. We were flying high, safety systems, fire and gas systems, you name it. But then Piper Alpha came along, which was not our system. But the health and safety executive in the UK said, stop. Everything stops. All the projects stop. And then they spent 10, 12 months, I forget what it was now, doing the investigation. The Cullen Report came out, uh, and I remember reading the Cullen Report about this thing. Um, and then the HSE came out with its guidelines for safety systems. What then happened after that was then we saw new standards starting to come out. The DIN VDE 0801 came out, I think, in 92. Then the, um, the Center for Chemical Process Safety came up with uh, the, um, a standard for chemical applications. The ISA 84 came out, and so on and so forth. 
and these were now looking at introducing some prescriptive means of, of designing these systems. So we started to get safe subsets of software. And ICS along with Triconics were probably responsible for pushing what was known as TMR. TMR, Triple Modular Redundancy. So the purpose of TMR was to give you high availability because it was two out of three and also high reliability. So this was the thing because in, the, in those days it was all about you've got to keep producing, you've got to be fault tolerant, you've got to do this. The thing about two out of three systems was that it's expensive because you've got three sets of hardware plus you have to maintain it and it wasn't applicable in every single case but it was something that was used as a, as a means of, of being able to outdo the competition. And the difference was that the ICS, we used uh, what was known as a HIFT implementation. HIFT is known as Hardware Implemented Fault Tolerance. So we had three systems all working in lockstep that was being controlled by the, the hardware. Triconic's way of doing it was known as SIFT. That's Software Implemented Fault Tolerance. So this is where you had basically three processes running asynchronously and they would use software to do the voting. So it wasn't as inherently reliable as the hardware implemented fault tolerance because of course, the, as I said, the problem with software is it's inherently covert and you can't possibly test all the permutations. So we had these standards coming up now we started to develop the quantitative risk analysis and then we looked at a more systematic approach for risk identification. So things were becoming a little more structured in the 1990s and as I mentioned to you already, we also had these prescriptive standards coming online which defined how systems should be designed and what equipment to use and how to configure it. So if we look then, we had more analysis going on where we would look at the potential hazards, identify those hazards and then perform some form of consequence analysis to be able to determine what the impact of these potential hazards could be. And then we would do our design per guideline as I said before. So this was something that was more prevalent in the late 80s and early 90s, especially after Piper Alpha. So, for example, I mentioned to you already, DIN VDE 0801. This determined that if it was a class 3, and a class 3 was uh, defined as being um, serious injury or fatality, then you had to design with three transmitters voted two out of three. You had to know, use what was known as, in those days, an AK6, which was basically a certified PLC, which could either be a triplex, a triconics, could be a Honeywell fail-safe computer or controller, FSC as it was then. Uh, and then the output would remove the air supply from the control valve. So if you look at this, what's actually wrong with this particular design? Well, the answer, of course, is the weakest link. And where is the weakest link? Well, of course, the weakest link is here. It's this solenoid and control valve. But this was what you had to do. So this was silly, really, because at the front end, you have this, this basically this expensive over-design here with the three transmitters and the AK6 PLC. And then at the back end, you have the solenoid and the control valve. And of course, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and the weakest link in this case is going to be the solenoid and the control valve. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But back then, if you were following 0801, that's what you had to do. You had to design it that way. So this was an example of a prescriptive standard.
The documents at the time that were driving everything, 0801 as I mentioned to you, came out in 1992. The CCPS came out with the guidelines for safe automation of chemical processes in 93. And then we had the ANSI S84, ISA 84, which came out in 96 and applied to um, the process industries. And then 10 years after Piper Alpha, we had the first draft release of IEC 61508. So that was in 98, and then the first release, of course, was in 2000. So when we get into the 2000s, of course, we, we start looking for better equipment. And as I said, the part of the reason why EXA exists today was because of this requirement for certified devices to 61508. And nowadays, what you'll find is that most manufacturers uh, that are supplying into the process industries and safety applications will have safety devices. These are devices that are properly certified to be used in the particular environment application and uh, SIL requirements. 2010, now we start getting into very few clients of customers that are operating in the or selling into the, the safety arena will, won't have these certified devices. And of course, more now uh, having cyber certified devices. 61508 was updated in 2010 to include cybersecurity, and that's why 1511 in 2016 was updated to include cybersecurity requirements. Because it's been recognized that cyber could be, if you like, the mother of all common cause. It doesn't matter what redundancy you have in place, what protection you have in place, if you get compromised from a cyber point of view, where somebody can get hold of the control system or the safety system and disable them and start opening valves randomly, then it, you, it counts for nothing. So the other thing that you'll find on the Exeter website, if you go to exeter.com, up in the top right hand corner you'll see the safe automation equipment list. And that SAEL gives you a list of suppliers who have certified equipment under different categories. So you can look under sensors, you can look at pressure, temperature, you can look at um, actuators, solenoids, logic solvers, you name it, you can look under there and you'll find particular manufacturers' devices that are certified. And if you click on the details tab, it will give you a, the certificate and the certificate on page two has all the failure rate information. If we're allowed to publish it, then there will be an assessment report as well, which tells you how these numbers were derived. I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of failure rate information uh, when we get into the 102 class in a couple of days' time, because it is significant when it comes to how you apply these numbers in calculations.